So with that said, I would like to introduce Amy Newfield and Lisey Harrison. These two co-founded Thrive. This is a wellness center that provides children of all ages and parents with a creative approach to therapy. Amy, a licensed marriage and family therapist, has worked in education and psychology for over 20 years. Lisey Harrison is a number one New York Times bestselling author and has spent over two decades researching and writing about complicated relationship dynamics. Um, they've combined their expertise to offer skills needed to lead drama-free lives. So enjoy, welcome. Did. We sound really good. Um, thank you for having us, first of all, and thank you all for being here at this ungodly hour. Um, and just to prove that we are so great at partnering, we did not plan this outfit situation. It came naturally, so we've got this down. Okay, well, um, like most business partner origin stories, ours began with a gynecologist. Show of hands, how many of you know Dr. James or Dr. James's practice? <laughs> Delivered many babies in this town. Well, when I moved from New York City to Laguna Beach 16 years ago, I didn't know anybody and I was pregnant with my almost 16 year old now, Jesse, and Dr. James had also just moved from New York and he, his, his wife was the receptionist. Mara, for those of you who don't know Mara, think the nanny from that sitcom, The Nanny. And she was like, oh my God, Lisi, you're Jewish? No way, we have another patient who's Jewish. Her name is Amy Newfeld. here's her email. <laughs> and I was like, okay, welcome to Laguna. So I did actually follow up with that because I didn't know anybody. And um, Amy and I became fast friends with a quick hard bond on psychology, on the human condition, on breaking it down, building it up, on self-improvement, on self-deprecation. It was our cardio and we loved every bit of it. And then our families became friends and our husbands became friends and it was adorable and it was glorious. And then Amy's marriage split up <laughs> and then my marriage split up. And now here we are lecturing you on co-parenting. Isn't that funny? I know the irony is not lost on us, but um, so why us? What gives us the ability to talk about co-parenting? Yeah, what gives us that ability? A lot. One thing we did is because our interest um, is in psychology and just self-improvement, we got together and we just supported each other. And then we sought out places to get that support. And we went to talks and we read books and we wrote books and we got degrees. And we learned what was working for us in our parenting relationship. And we learned what wasn't working in our parent relationship. And then we decided other people need to know what we learned too. We're qualified because of what we went through and we're qualified because of the work we did to get the information. And we wanna give it to you. It's helpful whether you are in a partnering uh, relationship in a home together, or if you're in a parenting relationship where you're in two homes and you're either separated, divorced, or maybe never married. This works for all partnerships. Take it away. It does, okay, so just bear with me on this screen. Um, if you're here, that means that you have probably figured out that co-parenting is hard. Parenting is hard. Being a human being on planet Earth is hard. Um, a lot like the characters in the books I write, we all sort of go through these daily rhythms or momentary rhythms where it looks like life is good, everything's going my way. Uh-oh, something went wrong. Huh, I need to learn and grow from this experience. I learned and, grow and grew, I fixed it, life is good again. And this rhythm comes and goes constantly throughout our lives pretty much until the day we die. It's a series of harmony, disharmony, and repair. Harmony, disharmony, repair. We go through it all the time. And so many of us get stuck on this idea that the disharmony is the moment of failure. That if there's a bump in the road, we have failed. We actually completely disagree with that. We think that moment of disharmony and failure is shining a light on what needs improvement. I don't know if any of you remember this moment in your lives. No, okay, so when I grew up, 
This was a thing that happened in seventh grade. Someone from the Dental Association would come to our classroom and make us all chew these red tablets. And the red tablets would leave a mark on your teeth where there was plaque. And it sort of showed you where you have failed to brush your teeth. Now, we're sort of using this as a metaphor for failure because really you could look at it and go, end scene, I'm a disaster, I can't brush my teeth, I'm gonna jump off the earth. But what it really is, is, oh, look at where I need to do the work. And that's what this is about. It's saying, okay, you're here, we're shining a light on areas where we need to do work. And in this scenario, I could go, okay, I've got some plaque. This wasn't mine, by the way. But you could go, I have some plaque, I need to go brush my teeth, and that's great if I get to deal with this problem on my own. But when you are co-parenting, you have someone else who also has this issue and they might deal with it in a completely different way. So what do you do when you're partnering with a totally different human being? And that person might react completely different to these scenarios. So we are going to try a little experiment to just illustrate this point, Amy, my assistant. <laughs> okay, if everybody would just take a look at this, and just think of something that comes to mind when you see this. It can be anything, no judgments. I, for example, think of Days of Our Lives. Say, mm -hmm. the hourglass, the soap opera. <laughs> I'm clearly dating myself here. I'm 90. But um, <laughs> that's what I think of when I see this. Amy, what do you think of? OK, so I think of Bible and Bible players out there. And I remember trying to cheat and I tilted a little bit. So I think of bottle when I think of the time I came bottle and to do it. Okay, so Amy's gonna throw that ball of yarn. If you catch it, please catch it. Just tell us what comes to mind when you see this. But then when you say it, when you say what comes to mind, you're going to then toss it on the <laughs> yeah. And hold on to it and throw it to someone else. And then when you catch it, you'll say your little thing and you're going to then hold the end of it and then toss it off. Okay. okay. And toss it to the person next to you, but then we're going to try and throw it and ball. Okay. So again, the bottle timer. Um, time management. Like, what's the time on for my son? Okay. Toss it. Hold on to the to the part of it and toss it. A what? A bra. A bra. I love it. Great. That's fantastic. Oh, I'm seeing, I'm see, you're seeing it like this? <laughs> That's fantastic. Okay. Okay. Toss it to someone else. I can't get Dave off of my life. Out of your head. But I also use a timer. It's not like that, but it's like a visual theater with my kids. Okay, great. Do it. Okay, just, there you go. Woo. <laughs> how much stuff I have to do, how much time I have to do it, <laughs> what the expectations are. Uh, I'll write it up. That's good. Okay. <laughs> um, days of our lives. Yeah. Like you, but it's, I think they said like times. Like, like sand time. through the hourglass. Sand These, are, so the so are, the so These are, are the days of our lives. So are the days of our lives. Yeah. Okay. Glad to bring that to your morning. I would say, first of all, I looked at that, I was like, okay, that's two minutes, five, like, shower time. What I would also say is, like, pause so you cannot read it back. So you did not have that dental issue that the person on the other side had. I did. Oh. <laughs> you learned. You repaired. Good job. Okay. Okay. That's great. Okay, toss it to someone in the front after. I'm stressed because time is limited. Yes. Okay, now send it all the way up to somebody. 
Nice. <laughs> Anxiety. Okay, great. Oh, yay! The second thought was balance. What is in the past, what is in the future. It's some kind of balance. I love it. Okay, great. Um, we can. Oh, one more. <laughs> we'll end here. It's <laughs> better be good. I think about our son, the same type of thing where we always set it up for him to limit time. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you for participating in this. But if you will all just take a minute and look around at this tangle, this mess, this is the metaphor for co parenting. 75% <laughs> of co parent relationships look like this. Why? Because you have two different people looking at the exact same thing, but they are bringing their own baggage, their own trauma, their own joys, their own memories, their own experiences to the table. And so two people can look at this and have a very different opinion. And that's one thing when you're looking at an hourglass, but when it's your child, that intensifies by about you know, 50x. So we just really want you to keep that in mind. Um, because every time things get complicated, before you start freaking out, <laughs> you have to remember that there is another person in this equation with you, and that person is not you, and that person does not have your references. And there we go. Okay, so what is co-parenting? I'm gonna regale you with one more story. Um, back when I was in couples therapy, working on my marriage, and our therapist said, okay, you and your husband are in a rowboat, and here, there's a beautiful island off in the distance, and I want you to both row to this island. Ready, set, go. So I start doing this, like vigorously rowing on each side of the boat, trying to get to this island, and he said, okay, stop, what are you doing? And I said, I'm rowing. And he said, well, that's not rowing. Rowing looks like this. And I was like, sorry, I grew up in Canada and we did a lot of canoeing. And he said, and why are you doing both sides? And I said, because I'm trying to get to the island. And he said, well, you have another person in your boat. Why are you doing it all for them? And meanwhile, he, of course, was just sitting there watching me, which again, is just so perfectly illustrates so much of my past, but I, in that moment realized I'm doing all the work. I'm not, we didn't even consult. I mean, this therapist's perfect situation would be, why don't you two get together, discuss your strategy, who's working what or, and how are you gonna get there together? And instead, the second he said go, I just took off on my own agenda and he did his own thing. And that is a perfect example of parallel parenting, which we are going to discuss a lot about. But first, I want to give you this co-parenting definition, which is when two people together take on the socialization, care, and upbringing of a child. They share the responsibility and the right to raise this human being together. And the elements that cause the kind of disharmony that a lot of us feel, those are the elements that are in an intimate relationship. And it's really important to know the difference. The issues in an intimate relationship are the things like, you don't take me seriously, you don't listen to me, you don't consult with me, all the things that we all tend to fight about the wear and tear of being in a partnership. But those are intimate relationship issues. In a co-parent relationship, you're coming together to focus solely on the child and you are working as a team. So the conversations should be more about are we meeting their needs? Are we doing what's in their best interest? Are we able to see beyond the hourglass and focus on the child? It's not a us against each other, it's a we. And if you sort of look up the term co-parent now, you'd be hard pressed to see it not associated with divorce or separation. 
but really co-parenting before really 1989 when the divorce community sort of commandeered that term and used it because they needed some term to describe what the two parents and two different households were doing. It really did refer to just two people parenting together. So for the sake of this conversation, co-parent to us means in the same house, in a separate house, it doesn't matter, you're two people with a shared interest of your child. So this parallel parenting, as I mentioned, um, that is a very common form of parenting. Um, and it really looks like each parent is sort of in their, on their own program, okay? When you're married, it looks like each one is parenting, but they sort of have their own rules. They're bringing their own thing to the table. There's no cohesion to what's happening. When the child is with one parent, they're getting one set of sort of rules and standards and expectations. When they're with the other parent, they're getting a totally different set. And this might feel like a win, and this is often a solution used by people who are, tend toward conflict because, hey, we're not together. We don't have to have any sort of consensus we don't have to fight, but it really does cause a lot of instability with the children because they're not getting this one sense of how they're supposed to be and what's what. In split couples, this is two homes, two completely different sets of rules. This is the child growing up with, you know, in this house, you get all the junk food you want. In this house, it's organic only. In this house, you know, this is the house where I'm going to go to have my sleepovers with my friends because my so-and-so doesn't care how late we're up if we're riding our e-bikes at, you know, midnight. They don't care. Party over there, not fun over there. Um, and the kids learn how to game the system in that situation. And again, they feel very, very unsafe and unstable. And kids need a lot of structure to feel stability and to feel safe. They feel like they're slipping through the cracks in the parallel parenting model. Conflicted parenting in married couples and in a worst case scenario is physical, emotional abuse. That's in the harder cases. Um, arguing, there's a lot of finger pointing. There's a lot of blame. There's name calling, there's door slamming. There's trying, one parent trying to ingratiate themselves with the child against the other parent. So, oh my God, if he does that, oh my God, look at your father. You know, it's really pitting the child against one parent or the other, putting them in the middle. And this just never works. I know that there's a lot of frustration sometimes and we all wanna look like the hero, but children want to love their parents. They desperately do. You know, that cliche of the child waiting on the curb with his baseball hat and the glove waiting for daddy to pick him up and daddy never picks him up. And it doesn't matter, that child will still make up a story about where daddy is because it's so painful for them to think anything other than this person loves me. So in my cliche scenario where the mother's like, your father's a deadbeat, he's feckless, he's this, he's that, the child will end up resenting the mother for speaking poorly about the father. It will never go the other way. So it just doesn't buy anybody anything to put one parent down for the child. Um, and in split couples, this it's everything I mentioned, and it's a lot of back and forth, which the child never asked for. And an example of conflicted parenting in this, a classic, is I bought you these clothes, they're staying at my house. I bought you this toy, it's staying at my house. He didn't pay for anything, why should he get it? When again, we tend to forget this isn't about the relationship issue, like I had mentioned before, this is a co-parenting issue. This is about the well-being of the child. And then the third model, collaborative parenting, that's sort of the gold standard. Um, and if you, if you sort of research this, you're gonna find it more likely called cooperative parenting we change that name. We don't like cooperative parenting. It sounds a little more like one person's making the rules, the other one has to follow them, they're cooperating. In collaborative parenting, it really states the essence of what we're going for, which is we are a team. We are coming together to, come, to figure out what is in the best interest of our child. And we are both bringing our hourglass stuff to the table 
and between your stuff and my stuff, we are going to come together and figure out what the right stuff is. In this model, there can be parallel parenting. There can be a division of labor. But the difference between the division of labor in, in um, collaborative par uh, parenting and parallel parenting is it's discussed. It's a plan. It's like a brand. Our family brand is this. So whether the parent, the child is with one parent or the other, oopsies, sorry, they know what they're going to get. Whereas in parallel parenting, they don't know what they're getting when they're with one parent or the other. There's no consistency. In split couples, this looks like the same rules in both homes. It looks like both parents speak respectfully about one another. It looks like clothes and toys go back and forth without a problem, nobody's keeping score. It looks like you're sitting together in sporting events, at plays, at dances, whatever. Both parents are sitting beside each other and you're still presenting as a united front. So you're able to say our relationship didn't work, but our parenting relationship is still very much intact. And p children who grow up in this environment, even if it's in a split couple home, will have a li lot likelier chance of having solid relationships, a sense of stability, lower anxiety, a higher self-esteem. Self they will be able to manage conflict better because they will see conflict in collaborative parenting. It's unavoidable. Disharmony, harmony, repair, it's going to happen. Harmony, disharmony, repair. But they will see it being resolved. And that is the key to raising a healthy child. So how do you get there? How do you get to collaborative parenting? I will tell you. <laughs> um, and this room is small. Am I, can you hear me here? Mm -hmm. OK, I'm worried about I'm shorter than my partner. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so with that parenting, I will, um, I will tell you that when I was married, it wasn't until I was divorced that I realized in my marriage, we also had parallel parenting going on. 50% of families have parallel parenting going on in split homes because it's better than having a conflicted. So it wasn't, you know, when I was talking, I'm thinking, you know, I did. I had parallel parenting when we were married, too. So it is, um, what we want to avoid is the and if there is conflict, like Lacey said, we want to make sure that we are showing them repair. What do we do to partner up better? Well, at Thrive, we have these three pillars that are the crux of a healthy relationship, a healthy parenting relationship. These are going to exist in any healthy relationship. We need trust, alignment, and communication in any relationship. You can add what we're saying and you can put it into the intimate relationship you have with your partner a friend, a sister, a parent yourself, your parent. In the parenting partnership, these pillars need to be there in order to parent together. Lisa mentioned a brand. Think of it as your own company, right? This is a company, and both of you are co-founders of this company. And so you are figuring out together how you're running, how you're growing your product. Take a minute, we gave you these cute little journals, and just rate yourselves one to five. One being, I'm not getting the communication I need, or I'm not delivering it the way I think is productive. Um, and a five being, we are on. We can get up here and talk about communication. <laughs> just write yourself real quick. You can jot it down, or you can just think it. Uh, anyone's out there? You can just nod. Or... Twos. Threes. Fours. So you five, so we're going to switch places. I'm just done. I'm talking about vacation. Okay. I don't know why I keep switching. I think I'm going to do this. Okay. I don't want to touch this. Okay. All right. So communication. And again, we're thinking about the communication in terms of the parenting partnership. And I'm going to ask you for this slide to also just think about in terms of everything. So. Communication. This is something that some of you have heard from me before. Um, this is my analogy of communication. Picture it like a game of catch, right? In a game of catch, the goal is to throw the ball back and forth. Throw the ball, and you're going to throw it to me. That's it. That's the goal, is to have this back and forth. If I throw you a ball that is so hard, right, and I'm winding up, and I'm about to beat it at you, 
I'm gonna do this, right? I'm gonna close my mitt and do this. The speaker, the community, the one delivering the message is the forever. You have a responsibility as the speaker and as the listener. As the speaker, your responsibility is to throw a catchable ball. If I'm winding up and throwing this hard ball at you, or yelling at you, or putting you down, the listener's going to close their neck and not want to play with you. If I throw a ball, let's say you're standing right there, I'm about to throw your ball, and I keep throwing it to the side, my message is too confusing. I'm talking way above you, talking beneath you, right? You're not getting my message. They're not going to play. Again, your message can't be delivered. There's nowhere for it to land. So the responsibility as a speaker is to throw a nice, good, catchable ball, clear with your words, direct, in a way that it can be heard. We're not going to attack, we're not going to blame, because we want the myth to be open. We want them to receive the information. Your responsibility as the receiver of the information is to keep your myth open. I am not catching a ball in my mitt like this. I am not going to hear you. If my mitt is open, I will hear you. I have a responsibility to listen openly. That can get hard, especially when the balls are a little hard throwing at you. But you keep fighting it, you keep your mitt open, and you will receive the information. How do we do that? We think impactfully, right? We think with, a, with not our own filter. We think as they are telling us what they want to say. It's theirs. I don't have to judge it. I don't have to agree with it. I just have to accept it as theirs. And if you can get there and get curious and wonder, I will tell you the, the best trick that will hack to being an okay listener, to having a mitt open, is to wonder. If you get curious, you get a little bit more interested. And then you get out of your head and how it has to do with you, and you're just receiving this information. So you can take that nugget into anywhere out in life, and then I'll bring that now to the parenting partnership. You know, in a parenting partnership, like I said, you know, that, that CEO, that company, it's the two of you growing up this product. Well, it gets really hard to not slip into that other role you have. The person I divorced, the person I'm married to, that relationship, that gets in the way. So if you can bring yourself back to, oh yeah, oh yeah, we're both co-founders and we are focused as this child. Right? So we want to keep bringing it back to that relationship, and I'll keep doing that here too. All right, there will come a time in your communication where you're both throwing fast hard balls at each other, right? And what happens to me, at least, what happens to a lot of people, is when they are feeling so much, when they're just up here and not in their head thinking, but just everything gets a little confused, because their emotions are taking them over at that point. We call that flooding. This is a little, um, this guy Dan Siegel is amazing. He came up with this hand model. You may have seen it a million times. All of us out there are doing it because it's so meaty and good. If this is your brain right here, our long hand is my brain, okay? And this part is my forehead right here. This is right on the inside. We've got all the emotional stuff in here. The yeah, amygdala, the hippocampus, all the emotional stuff goes on here. Fight or flight is down here. On top, we have this cerebral cortex. Prefrontal. This is where all of our decisions get made. Right there, right here. This is our thinking part of our brain. So this is how we walk around. We're regulated here, right? We just need these two to be close to each other so that you can do both. You can feel and you can think. When the feeling takes over, we flip our lid, and now you notice how far apart the thinking part and the feeling part are. You need them to be closer together in order to be to communicate. When we're here, we're not going to communicate well, meaning we're not going to receive information and we're not going to deliver it in a productive manner. So the goal is, if you start to feel, and this is your work, you try to feel, I don't know where you feel, I feel mine here and here. That's another story about my whole voice, my voice lessons I need to be able to speak better uh, and get my feelings out. But figure out where your trigger is, maybe it's your stomach, maybe you're just starting to shake a little bit. Catch it early. Know that this is happening. Hopefully before you get to here, because that's when we say the things that, oh, that really sting. Um, when you're starting to feel it, that's when you, you need to get yourself and take a break, okay? Almost anything will work again if you unplug it for a few minutes and 
that's including you. Unplug for a second. It used to be, we used to call them, we still do call them timeouts. But what do you think of when you hear timeout, right? Sit in the corner, nobody go down. It's a punishment. This timeout is the best gift you can give yourself and your parenting partner. Use this with kids too. Please, it's great. We make these calming boxes and uh, I do them for adults, we do them for kids. And the kids, we have these little pinwheels, we have sun, we have little things that they can just enjoy for a moment. The whole goal is just to go from here to here. When you do this at home with your parenting partner, you're not allowed to tell them they need a time out because they will further show you. But you take it. Even if you're not the one that's here and you see your partner is, say, you know what, I'm going to just go, just soothe myself for a second. I'm going to go calm down for a sec because I'm starting to feel something. And you go to your spot, listen to music, doodle for a second. It's not the time where you're thinking, what can I do better? Am I getting too involved? Or is this her, his perspective? Maybe I should. I don't want you thinking. I just want you coming down. So just be in the moment, present-minded. Art takes us to the moment. So if you have a doodle, it turns off that kind of thing that's going on and that feeling, and you just start to sense and collect data, and you get very present-minded. So doodle a little bit, listen to the music. After about 20 minutes, that's a great time period, come back in. Don't leave it alone. So you want to come back to the conversation. So how to exit? I need to take 20. 20 minutes is a great time. An hour is a little long, but depending on how much you're here, you may need to walk, take a little walk for a second. Um, five minutes is a little quick. So I would say 20 is the perfect time, 15 to 20 minutes. Say, I'm going to take 15 minutes and let's get back in the We walk to make sure that repair happens. We're not sweeping it under the rug here. Okay. okay, so we want to make sure that we do what we need to do so we can be a good communicator. Communication is one of the pillars of this healthy approach to parenting. That's what we need in order to have a good parenting partner. We need good communication. Let's talk about we're not the hourglass. We're not going to have the same opinion about everything. How am I going to express it to you? I still need to remember that. Okay. The next one is alignment. And I have a little fun activity for you. So, Alignment has to do with values. There's lots of things you can share with your parenting partner. There's interests, right? You can share similar interests. You can have a vision. You can have goals. Those are all important. And you can come together on those. The values, the core values, are really important to align. It's okay if you have lots of different ones, but on the three core values, you want to help that you can get to the place of communicating those with your partner. And maybe if they don't, sorry, huh? <laughs> <laughs> do we want this on me? Just leave it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Maybe if we want, um, if we're a little different on one of our really far off on our, our core values, we can communicate and help us get us aligned a little bit. So I'm going to have you open up your journals, and I would like to play a little values game. I want you to look at this list. I've given you some up here. You can think of others too. But I'd like you to go ahead and write eight that stand out to you. Eight that you like, eight that are important. They're probably all important. It's going to be hard maybe to will it down. But go ahead and jot down eight. As you're finishing up your eight, <clears throat> this is something great that you can bring home and do. That would have been great if we had that copy. 
Sorry we don't, but you can snap a picture or just go online, get a values list and give it to your parenting partner and say, I'm just curious, you know, what, what's important to you? I'd love to know. I'm interested on what really hits home to you. That might be hard if you have some a lot of friction in your relationship, right? But you can't um, ask them in terms of them. You know, I would love to, I'd love to know you at the core a little bit. What matters most to you? So we've got our eight. Now what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to cross out um, three of those. No, five. No, three. <laughs> so cross out three. Which can be hard because of course you just picked your eight and they're all important to you. I ask you to just, they still can be important, you still get to hold them as a value. I'm going to ask you to just cross out three of them. We've got five left. Of those five, I would like you to circle three of those. They're all important, but I want you to circle three, leaving two behind. What is the three represent? Here we go. <laughs> it's like a, one of those horoscope things. If you think. <laughs> so we've got our three. Does anybody want to share what they came up with? The three core values? Yeah. Integrity, compassion, adventure. There you go. Does that fit? That really sums you up? Right. So you've got your three core values. At your core, that's what's important to you. At your parenting partner's core, they might not have those same shared values. At the core. So there's where the communication comes in. Let's talk about that. Let's, let me share you, my core values with you. So when something does get heated, we can bring it back to, oh, that's something that really matters to my partner right now because education is the most important thing to him. Out of this huge list, that was important. That's where he's coming from. We do want to align a little bit if we can. And the beginning of aligning is sharing, right? They have to know where you're coming from. So I'd like to have a values talk. I'd like to get a family constitution. What's important to this family? What's important to our parenting team, right? When you come together as a company, at least you and I had to sit down and say, who are we? As your parenting partner and you sit down to talk about who you are as parents, well, you gotta have some things that align, right? So that's an important conversation to have. I do family constitution work at, at, at Thrive, and it's not just for the parenting partnership. You should include the kids, right? Have them figure out the same game that we just did. It'll change as they grow, but what's important to this family? And we're going to stick to these constitutions, these, these core values that make us us as a family, and we're going to operate as best we can with those core values. So, they're not always, we're going to have some friction, right? There's going to be times when your child comes to you and presents themselves or a situation and it's going to tap into some of these values. <laughs> okay, well then, okay, here we go. So your daughter comes home and says, I really want blue hair. Right. One of the parents are saying, all right, what color blue? How cool. The other one says, absolutely not. You will not leave the house if you have blue hair. That it's okay, it's no big deal. The other one is like really operating out of something core to them. So what do you do? We'll tell you that later in the talk, but for right now, no. What you do is you come together and you talk about, okay, where, what are we hitting here? What values are we hitting? Let's go back to our constitution and say, okay, why is this no big deal to me? And why is this so important to you that she doesn't. Let's go back to those values. Let's really look at them and see where we're hitting on both of us. And you communicate and you align. You realign, right? So that happens on our cars all the time. We have to realign our tires. You realign. We come together on what we're, what's important to this company. You're both in it together. When we don't, when we've got this going on, what starts to happen is we polarize. So we've got one parent, that's a little, we call it the hard parent, one parent can be the soft parent, and that happens a lot in parenting. And what happens is the harder parent, when the harder parent gets a little harder, the softer, band, 
the softer one gets a little more soft and caudal, right? And what will happen then now is when we've got this hard parent and this soft parent, you'll start to polarize. So one's here and one's here, and the child just goes right through the middle. We've lost focus. We've lost focus on the child, and we need to refocus so there's not this big gap. So when you think about alignment, think about the parenting team coming together a little bit closer. So there isn't this big gap for the child to go through. It's very confusing when there's a lot of polarizations. The side, the child feels like they kind of have to pick, right? They, of course, are going to pick the one that they align with themselves. And that doesn't feel good to the child at all, to have one that's not picked, whether you're married or not. It doesn't feel good. This alignment and communication is showing the child we are a parenting team. Whether you're married or not, feeling like you've got a team supporting you creates well-adjusted, resilient, healthy kids with a solid self-esteem. It's not the fight, because we, we get to repair the fight. We want to show them fights, but it's the team, the understanding and the learning that you could do conflict and then come together and make that decision as a team. That's how they're going to become resilient. That's where they're going to get their strength from. Okay, let's move on to the next pillar. Trust. So when we think of trust and we think of couples, I don't know, I think of cheating. <laughs> I think of, that's what I think of when I think of a couple that doesn't have trust or faith in their other partner. I think, oh, well, they're afraid that they'll cheat. That's what goes on in my brain when I think of trust and couples, married or not. When we think of trust, in a parenting partnership, I want you to sp uh, broaden that definition a little bit. It, while you have your journals on your laps, go ahead and write down a person or two in your life, anybody, past, present, future, well, not future, past or present, that you really have a lot of trust in, a lot of trust and a lot of faith. One or two people that you can jot down and put those names down. Think about why you trust that person. What is it about them? Anybody want to share? What is it? Why that person? Why did you write that person? What do they do? What have they done to earn such solid trust that of all the people you know, you put their name down on that paper? What qualities do they have or what relationship do you have? Yeah. Um, I put my mom and my husband. Uh -huh. um, even when you mess up, they've got my back. Um, I can be really angry and say things I don't mean, but it's still forgiven. Mm -hmm. And they know, like, okay, she'll, she'll come around. Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I usually do. I like that. They have your back. Yeah. You know it. Excellent. Anybody else want to share? Why you pick that one person? I know it's, it feels good to trust somebody else, mm -hmm. right? Trust, we said, you know, what comes to mind when you think of trust in parents or, or the, that relationship, the husband-wife relationship. I told you mine was infidelity. It comes to mind. That's what people come in to see me for. Um, trust in the parenting team, right? The, the parenting team is what we're thinking about. So infidelity doesn't come into that, right? We're trusting our partner as the other parent. So not trusting your parenting partner might sound, this is one example like this, don't forget to take the coat to the movies. It gets cold in the movie theater. Did you pack a snack? They get really hungry after school. That's not trusting your parenting partner. Micromanaging is one way we don't trust our parenting partner. We need to trust that the other parent has the same goal in mind and it's to raise this healthy human being. I'm not going to starve my child, right? They might approach it in a different way. You have to trust that their way works for them and, their, and your child together. So to accept them. So yes, you are right also. Having their back, knowing they are going to do good for the product that you are trying to raise here. Okay, so it's a practice. Trust doesn't happen automatically. Right? If so, then we'll come to thrive and we'll do some boundary work. Um, but practicing trust, it takes time to build that trust. It takes a lot of time. We need to make sure that we do, um, we're going to quit the, the micromanaging. 
we're going to check out versus check in. We're going to stop checking in with the other parent because the other parent won't feel like you have faith in them, that you trust them. When you do leave it up to them, that instills this sense of like, oh, they think I got it. By the way, side note, do that with your children too. When you micromanage your children, you are telling them, the message you're sending to them is, they don't think they got, you don't think they got this, right? So if we want our parenting partner to feel really good about their parenting, let them do it their way. Have trust and faith that you two have aligned, you're communicating, and they are bringing up this child the way you guys have decided, in their way. Now, if it's something that's really itching at you, go back to that baseball analogy, right? Later on, connect with them and say, you know, I was constantly worrying about whether they were being cold, and I felt like I wanted to ask you, but I knew you had this. I'm not sure how I, do you have any ideas for me on how I can alleviate? I want to get the information, but I also know you got it. So questions are great. What are your thoughts on that? Right, so come together, use communication as a brilliant tool. Some interventions, the hard one, soft one. I mentioned what can happen when it's the hard one and the soft one, and that's really polarizing, and the kid just slips right through the middle. If you have that in your home, super common, don't worry. Um, <clears throat> sometimes, switch it up. So if something went wrong, um, and there has to be a consequence delivered to your child, which happens and should all the time, it's okay. Um, have the hard one play the other role. Have them be the like soother and the coddler and the, I know, that sucks, huh? Have the soft one deliver the consequence. So we decided because this happened, you know, you didn't show that you had really great responsibility. Dad and I decided, Mom and I decided that your iPad's out. The two of us came together and decided, you know, you abused electronics, and we came up with uh, three days that we're going to put it to rest for a little bit. Switch roles. Let them see that shows team. That shows that you came together. What happens there sometimes is when, and I forgot to mention this in alignment, um, when you come back and you deliver the message to the child of this is what we decided to do, whether the hard one or the soft one or whoever is delivering it, the child probably knows which side of the fence you landed on, and most likely the reaction is going to be, you're just doing it because they said so. And you can say, you know, at first, I did have an opinion, but we are a team, and we decided this together. Using we, using us, and using team. Use those words. They have an impact. Show it, and say it. So, you know, we both talked about it, and we absolutely, nobody was persuaded one way or the other. We came up as a team. We decided that this is the way it's going to go. Um, the code word. This is a really neat intervention. You are going to trust your partner enough that they are going to pull you out when you need pulled out. When one of your partner is up here, and they're in it, and they're throwing all kinds of hardballs at the child, watermelon whatever your word is, and your partner's going to hear that and know that they trust you enough to say, okay, they're calling me out a little bit. They've got my back, right? They know that as a team, I'm coming at it too hard, so I'm gonna trust enough. That has to be set up a lot ahead of time, right? Because it could come across, you've gotta really set that and have a good conversation about that. Like, when I get a little um, too soft with my child, when I'm coddling, when I should kind of stand my ground, can you throw out watermelon then? That's when I need it. And then the other. All right, well, when, can I, when do you think you need watermelon? You probably know when they need watermelon, but let them come up with it, right? <laughs> when do you think you need watermelon? So the cohort's a great intervention, and it's practicing trust. It feels, I promise, it feels like a team when you do it. Because when you set it up ahead of time and then you use it, you're like, whew, pulled you out of that one, right? Your, oh, I lost that last one. Your partner, oh, they can be a great resource. Know that they have something, the outer glass, they have something different that they're bringing to the table. When I come to a parenting partner and I say, what would you do if, or I'm not sure what to say to her about. When you are really interested in what they would do, 
it brings you together. It creates the trust. You trust them enough to value their opinion on something. This is how we practice trust. This is how we start building those blocks of trust. Okay, what is next? Let's see. <laughs> Here it is. We waited and we got it. <laughs> so that's how you do it. Perfect parenting. It doesn't always go so perfectly. Uh, what happens when none of this works? Because it's not always going to work. You find yourself, what happens a lot is when we get off, when we're tilted a little bit in our parenting, we're not coming together, communication isn't happening, I'm really throwing those hard balls. We need to have an intervention. We need to do what Lisa and I have come up with this model, and we're going to teach it to you right now. We want you to know that it's normal and it's okay. The beauty of this parenting partnership, the same thing we talked about earlier, is we're going to have harmony, disharmony, and repair. The repair is important for your child to see, and it's important for your team to go through that. It makes you stronger. So I like when there's conflict. There's an opportunity, just like failure. We're coming up with a new word. I promise you we'll come up with a new word for failure. Because failure is a gift, it gives you something. Conflict and fighting is a gift, it can give you something. I used to teach an anger management course, and in this course I would always sit them down and I would say, this is not a course in how to not be angry. You can't not be angry. It's an emotion, it's a feeling, it's how to manage it. So we want to manage this conflict and use it. Stuff comes out in fighting, right? Anger is, has, has passion and heat, and sometimes I say what I really need to say. We need to be careful on how we're throwing that, right? And when we're here, that's when the stuff's going to come out too much when we need a break. I can be here, I can feel, and I can get some stuff out, and then I can say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get breathe for a second, I'll be right back. Feel it, but know how to feel it. When you're in this parenting partnership, that emotion is bound to come up a lot. You have a really special thing. You both have an insane amount of vested interest in. <clears throat> and trust that they do too. Communicate to them in the best way possible. And go back to that constitution. So when it doesn't happen, what are we gonna do? Here, here's what you're gonna do. We're going to give you another scenario and you've got this, this kid comes home, right? <laughs> And he comes home from his sport and he says, I'm out, I'm done. Yes, I have invested X amount of years in this. Okay, you've paid for club. We've traveled to Vegas. You know <laughs> all of your friends are from my soccer team, but I'm out. I'd rather do, I don't know, something else. What happens? Well, oftentimes what happens is we, get, we can have that polarization, right? One parent is like, absolutely not. No way, we've invested time, money, energy, and plus, we're not teaching you to give up, right? We are not going to teach you, we're gonna teach you to work through something. You've committed to this, you're on the high school feeder team, you're going to play in high school. You have worked your whole life for this. Um, I don't wanna teach you to just give up. I wanna teach you to work through something that's hard. The other parent might have a different view. They might say, you know what? Try new things, great. You've done this for a while, you've done it. Now see what else is out there. I love that, be you. I'm empowering to be you. It's not my life. You're not playing for me. Do what you want to do. You can make arguments both ways, and they're great. And going back to the, you know, what our constitution is, might not be hitting on that. You might be too far apart on this one. Communicating is just triggering. So we're going to give you a method that when those pillars are kind of crumbling down, a little hard to build up, we're going to have you follow this acronym and it's think child. So, the C, the C up there stands for child, child first. That is your focus. And I will tell you in your little books, we do have this in a sticker on the inside flap, just so you know. You're going to think child first, that's your focus. It's very easy to slip in to the intimate relationship or the co-parenting divorce relationship that you have and bring yourselves into it. You are a parenting team. Think of it as a one unit, okay? So this parenting team is going to shift their focus to the child. That can be literal. Look at the child, listen to the child, 
Think about it in their terms, not yours. So you are only going to go right to the child. That's really important because we don't want to lose focus. We're bringing it, that'll help you bring it back to the parenting team and not what you're bringing it yourself. I'm going to have Lucy, will you explain? Yes. Okay. So the H is for have empathy. And as you know, empathy, we all know, walk in somebody else's, walk in somebody else's shoes. It's one thing to intellectualize that. Oh, I know what that's like. But real true empathy is actually feeling their feelings. So if somebody's upset because they got fired from their job, and maybe I've never been fired from a job, I can still empathize because if I boil it down to the actual emotion they're feeling, it's rejection, it's fear. It's, I can find things in my life that I can connect to on that so I can empathize. And the first thing to do is have empathy, not necessarily for your kid, although yes, you can really get curious about what's driving their decision, what is making them come to this conclusion, but in this case, in this structure, have empathy is have empathy for your partner. It's going back to that hourglass. It's saying, hmm, I'm the one that's being super chill about this, let them follow their own path. If my partner is the one that is digging their heels in, why? Ask questions. Think about what their background is, where they're coming from. Did sports get them into college? Did that create a community for them that has lasted to this day? Was it an escape for them to get out of a troubled home? Really ask yourself why they are coming at it from this place and then try and feel it because that will just completely soften you. It is really hard to be mad at somebody or staunchly disagree with somebody when you're like, oh yeah, this got them into college. They come from a family, they couldn't afford college. Soccer scholarship got my person into college. Of course they think this is important. And let's come from it from that place as opposed to, you're just oppositional, you're always trying to disagree with me, why do you care so much? The, you know, it's really just stepping into that person's world and it creates a tremendous amount of love and understanding. The next one, I. <laughs> identify your part. Identify your part in this disagreement. So did you take it from a two to a 10? Are you not having empathy? Are you not listening to the child first? Are you not considering them first? Really sort of look back at the other steps and ask yourself first, what have I done to turn this situation into a bit of a crisis? And then here's a tricky thing because sometimes we don't have a part. Sometimes we're kind of innocent in this. For example, you come home, grocery shopping, you're stressed out, you're exhausted, and a fight has, is underway currently in your home. Turns out your partner went rogue and said to your child, I don't care how you feel, there's absolutely no way you're quitting soccer. Now you're just this victim of a drive-by fight that like, you had nothing to do with, so what is your part? Well, you might not have had a part in creating the conflict, but you have a responsibility to um, remedy the conflict because this is your child, child first, this is your co-parent, team first. So your responsibility in this situation might be to de-escalate it. It might be to be the one that has the peace of mind to remember, we're gonna calm this down. We're gonna do that. We're gonna, everybody, Take five, you're not gonna come in when everything is hot and try and regulate it and play referee. You have the luxury of clarity in that moment and your part might be to use it. It's really just, the eye is really just an opportunity for some real self-reflection and to sort of slow things down for a minute. Ego, ego. On, ego, ego baby. Ego. ego, let go of your ego. Let go of my ego, was that yeah. what it was? <laughs> Let go of your ego. Let's take a look for a second about what ego is. Ego is part of you. It's a sense of self. It's just not your true self. It's a developed self based on what feedback was given to you. So it's a false sense of self, right? We all have them. It's okay to have an ego. You want to keep it in check. But what drives you when you're in ego mode is what other people think. It's the shoulds. So actually, that can be a a good word for you, if any time you hear yourself saying, I should really blank, 
I should really tell my kid he should play soccer. Um, that's the outside operating instead of coming from the inside. So ego is this sense of self that got developed at a pretty early age because feedback was given to you. Somebody laughed at something you did or you got a gold star on something and you liked the way it felt. Ego really seeks pleasure. So you will then learn and grow and be that person because you learned that worked for me. That felt good. We're hopefully develop our whole life. We spend time getting to know our true sense of self. That's all this self-help stuff is out there. Finding out who we are at the core. So when our ego gets involved in our parenting breakdown, right? When things are going wrong, check your ego. Why, does, why is this important to me? In our scenario with a soccer player, is it important because I don't want people to think my child's a quitter? Right? Is it important because what will the other people say? Or is it important because all my friendships are there and I feel important being on this and I'm getting something out of it? We want to leave our ego out of the parenting partnership because when it gets in the way, we're not operating from what's real. And then we tend to a little bit get close mitted or deliver these really harsh things that are said because it's more operating out of ego and not our true self. It's easier to be empathic when our ego is not front and center. Um, I'm doing, I'm doing deliver message. Okay, so we talked about that a lot, delivering a clear message. Um, so we focused on the child, we're having empathy here, we're really empathically reading and listening and what's going on. Um, we know our role in this. Sometimes, like Lisa said, our role is to do nothing, right? Or say, watermelon, um, let go of your ego, and then we're going to deliver a clear message. That is super important because there has been a big breakdown in communication when something's not working. The core of a healthy relationship is communication. We're telling you all three pillars are important in every relationship. In the parenting and in other relationships, communication is about connecting. Communication doesn't have to be speaking. It can be doing. Behavior is communication. And with your kids, a lot of times it's the behavior that's the communicator. So you have to watch what they're doing and think about what they're doing and what they're showing you. With adults too, what is the behavior they're doing? What is my partner in parenting doing? That can be a real message there. And you're going to get very clear with communicating and you're going to say, I've noticed. Those two words are brilliant. I've noticed. We didn't start with you. You keep doing, you keep letting him get away with things. I've noticed lately that you feel more comfortable telling him not to play soccer. I'm curious why. That's focusing on a clear message. The message doesn't always have to come from you, right? You are trying to also get clarity on the situation. Deliver a clear message. I, always start with I, I'm feeling this way. So here's what I'm thinking, and I'd love your thoughts on it. I'm thinking it's okay for him to let go of soccer for a little bit. What do you think? Different opinions, clear, clear, clear messages. Um, and then what we have for you, actually, we've got some, sorry. This isn't a one and done. Like this acronym will help keep you on track. It'll help remind you of the pillars and help build those up again and operate from them. It's a daily practice. Lisi and I have spent 20 plus years getting here. Um, there are so many great books. We're so lucky that School Power and our district here in Laguna Beach provides wonderful experiences for us to learn. We have these book clubs, and if you haven't participated in them, I highly recommend it. They pick wonderful books. Um, I showed you three others from there. Uh, Co-parenting is a great one. Raising Good hum Humans and All Joy and No Fun is fantastic. Um, they're all good. Go to talks like this. Soak in the knowledge. We're all saying about the same thing out there, but we have different takes. Something might really kind of hook onto you a little bit differently. And there are different approaches. Find the one that really works for you. Just want you guys to come together as a team. That's the most important. So go to the talks. Two Instagram follower followings that we love our, our little gurus. One is G Talks. She's fantastic. She's an, I think she's an LSW, I think. Um, and she talks about the relationship in general. And remember, your intimate relationship, your partner relationship as just husband and wife or two parents that aren't together is, you know, separate from this parenting relationship. She talks a lot about relationships in general, 
and it's really helpful to bring in and remind you about that team approach. We've got couples counseling for parents, a period in between each. He's phenomenal. He's also um, he's an MFT, I believe, a marriage and family therapist. And he does also talk about just the relationship between, the intimate relationship between the couple, the couple relationship. And he talks a lot about the parenting relationship, too, and brings in a lot of parenting stuff. And he does a lot of reels. He's, he's super helpful. So find something on Instagram. Those quotes, like the unplug one that I did, they, they resonate sometimes, right? You find a good one, and you get that, oh, yeah, and then you share it with a bunch of people. Print one out. Write one down. They help. Um, and then the co-parenting support groups, we have at Thrive, actually. We're running them at, um, on Thursdays at 10 now. And again, we have different groups, different people. Some are coming in from different backgrounds, right? Divorced, together. And we talk about the parenting team because we need support in everything we do. That's why we have our girlfriends. That's why we have our therapists. That's why we have the books support us, the talks support us. You're looking for support, and it's out there. So it definitely isn't a one and done. It is a daily practice. It sure, sure is. is. Um, um, also, just so you know, the child acronym does work for every sort of relationship you have. We use it for our business relationship. We yeah. just replaced the C with a T for thrive, so it's filed. <laughs> <laughs> But it really, if you run those steps with any relationship you have, when you reach conflict, you will be able to methodically and calmly work through the conflict and reach a resolution with very little wear and tear. So just keep that in mind and always refer to it. Um, we do have these quizzes. If you're interested, you can come and see us afterwards and you can grab one. And it'll just help you realize and get clear on how you guys in your own relationships are working the three pillars. How aligned are you? How solid is your communication? How much trust do you have? It'll give you an evaluation and it will be the metaphorical red film on the tartar of your teeth and it will allow you to see where the issues are and how to address them. So it's a really good place to start and start your daily practice.